This is episode 122 of AA Beyond Belief. In today's episode, Angela B. and I will be talking about step two, taking a look at the step from a secular perspective. But before getting to that, we're going to read some of the email that you've sent us over the last couple of weeks. There she is, Angela. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm here, ready to do this. <laughs> yeah, of course. the um, The beginnings of podcasts are always really awkward because we've actually already said hello and talked. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, I was just telling you that I thought maybe it might be nice to start this podcast by going through some emails that that we've gotten over the last week. And you know, I do periodically get emails that are that the podcast kind of triggers people to write. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, if I get an email, it has to do with the podcast. And I've not been good about sharing them or talking about these emails on the podcast itself. I do respond to people, Mm -hmm. but I thought it might be interesting to to read some of these. Okay. Here we go. Now, this is actually one that came in just this morning. It comes from Kelly G. And it's kind of interesting. Um, She says, Hi, John. Thank you so much for responding to a previous email. I'm really enjoying your back episodes. Right now, I'm listening to Angela from episode 108, and I'm getting so much out of it. She's great. I do have a question for you. No hurry, but this is the dilemma I'm dealing with internally. This may sound strange, but the only thing that's keeping me from going to AA meetings, actually, I've been to a couple of close meetings, is introducing myself as an alcoholic. There's no doubt that I have had alcohol use disorder. I definitely qualify for AA. I've actually been sober for five years. What my problem is, is that I feel the term alcoholic is so derogatory that I can't bring myself to say it. I feel that negative labels are damaging. It could also be my oversized ego, she says, LOL. Anyway, it seems as though secular AA is more flexible in many ways, and I wondered if you have any opinion or experience on the subject, or do you know of a podcast episode or any literature that addresses this issue? I would definitely try to go back to AA meetings if I knew I wouldn't be looked down on for not introducing myself that way. I feel like it might be an insult to the ones that do introduce themselves as alcoholics. I've often wondered if I could just say, I'm Kelly, and I have a desire to stop drinking or something like that. Wow. Well, cool. Yeah. My experience is that at our group, we're super open about that. Some people uh, share that they're alcoholics. Some people don't. Some people say addict alcoholic. Some people say I have a desire to stop drinking. Um, yeah. So for our, our personal group, uh, you know, a secular group, yeah, we, d- we don't care. Um, in other meetings, in open meetings in our area, most open meetings are pretty pretty good about that too as far as how people introduce themselves um, even in the closed meetings um, the some of them that state in their introduction that you have to have a desire to stop drinking and so there are people who who introduce themselves that may be new at their first meeting and stuff and will just say that you know I'm so and so and I have a desire to stop drinking and yeah so I, I think that that's that's you know, usually acceptable in most areas. Uh, of course, you know, there are going to be some people that that try to, you know, like if somebody, this happens quite a few times in meetings, I see where someone's accepting a 30 day coin or and they're nervous. And so they're, you know, they're asked to speak and they're like, um, yeah, so this is how I did it. And then somebody's like, what's your name? You know, oh, I hate that. Yeah. I hate that. <laughs> or who are you? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm Angela. I'm alcoholic, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, so so I, I I have seen that happen, but in general, yeah, you know, we've had it as a topic before whether or not um, calling yourself an alcoholic or introducing yourself as an alcoholic is uh, helpful or not helpful. Um, we have several group members that um, that have been you know reading lots of different literature that that um, agree with. Um, was it Kelly that uh, that they think that it's it's damaging and, and not helpful and so they they don't do it and they particularly like coming to our meeting because they can feel comfortable not doing it there when they go to other meetings sometimes um, they'll still introduce themselves as alcoholic because they feel that's the protocol for that meeting but yeah I can definitely yeah, it's not a requirement yeah I can see where she's coming from and um, and if it's not not helpful or if it's definitely you know more emotionally damaging then you know go with what, what 
what works for you. But you I know. think I'm going to try to introduce myself in a different way. Maybe I'll just say, hi, this is John or whatever, because <laughs> yeah. I'm beginning to think that maybe this is kind of an obstacle. Mm-hmm. I haven't run across this a whole lot, but I have over the last few years had people, you know, say that they are uncomfortable introducing themselves that way. And it almost puts pressure on someone who's new. If they see everyone introduce themselves that way, if they feel like they have to do the same thing, but no, it's not necessary whatsoever. Yeah. So yeah, I do know that um, some meetings do the going around the table where everybody introduces themselves and says they're an alcoholic before the meeting even starts. And so yeah, I've been to a meeting like that. Yeah. And so it's, it's good for, you know, our listeners to be aware that, that, that does happen in, in some meetings and, and stuff. But yeah, I also think that with, you know, the secular perspective, um, a lot of us read a lot of different literature and are aware of, of you know, newer studies and things about, um, about addiction. And, um, and so I think that groups, you know, uh, might want to look at that a little bit more, you know, even our group of, you know, I, I do know that there's some in the East that that don't do any of that. They they hardly read anything in the beginning. They're just kind of like, we're a meeting, we're starting, I'm Joe, let's go, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. And, uh, and I think that would, that would be refreshing. It'd probably be, I, I'd be a little shocked at first, like, am I in the right place? Um, but I, I'd adjust quickly. And I think that would be, that would be wonderful, particularly for people who are new, um, to recovery. So now here's an email from Sherry O. And this is probably something that we're going to definitely need to address in step four. But she says you and Angela B touched on something that I have been trying to reckon with and working through the steps. In step four, we are supposed to look at what part we had in each of our resentments. I was sexually abused at the age of 11, which I resent and suppressed. My discussion point would be what part does a person have in this type of resentment? You have asked for suggestions on what people would like discussed in these episodes, and that would be a topic I would think would be valuable. Thank you for reviewing these steps again. I'm starting all over next week using Staying Sober Without God with a few women, and the more input, the better. Wow. Yeah. Well, very cool that she's getting together with some people, and, and I haven't read that one yet. So um, so yeah, I'm, I'd like to hear what they have to say and what they're they're learning. Um, but yeah, well, d- we can definitely address that. And, and, um, because it's part of my story as well. Um, and, uh, and almost every woman that I've worked with, um, it's part of their story. And so, so yeah, so when we get to step four, I think it, we, we may have to like divide it into two sections yeah. because there's, there's a lot going on. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, you know, I will definitely touch on, on that and, um, and different ways that, that you can look at it or, you know, not work with it or whatever. My, my biggest thing right now would be to, to make sure that, um, you know, if possible that you've talked about it with a therapist or a a professional, um, because, uh, for me, recovery, uh, would be a lot more difficult if, you know, if, if available at all if I didn't look at that stuff with somebody who, you know, is knowledgeable about how to process that information. And then Tracy, I think you you may have gotten a hold of her. She um, just listened to episode 108. She lives in the Middle East and she just uh, wanted to get some advice from you about how to navigate navigate the steps in a secular way. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, it, I did get a hold of her and um, and we, we, you know, sent some emails and stuff a little bit and sent her some resources on on the different books and the different websites that we have and different tools that we use and um, and then you know was happy to be able to to be of assistance more to her that's as well. Cool. So that's one of the, uh, the fun things about this podcast is people from really all over the world you know listen to this and they write and it's like it's I don't know man it's really it's almost kind of humbling that that we can do this, that we can actually reach people from around the globe like that, and they, and they care enough to write. It's a thank right. I'm grateful. Yeah. That they do. It's a great experience. Yeah, yeah. I I really appreciate it. And and I was telling John before we started that, you know, I had a rough week. My mom's had some health stuff and and um and that, you know, getting emails and, and having people respond and, and let us know that this is helpful is, you know, that goes a long way to to helping me work through, you know, some of the the less um than pleasant but real life stuff that you that we get to go through, you know, when we're sober. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate it. And it helps keep 
keep me going. The funny thing is my mom listened to our podcast and I I hadn't given her the link. She knew that I was doing some sort of secular AA podcast, you know, one of those things that you kind of mention to a parent or someone and they're like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, you know, um, but she was she was oh, Googling a secular AA and found, <laughs> and found us. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> and so I thought that was funny. Yeah. She was like, oh, I liked your podcast. And now here's um, Lisa M. And she's great. She actually um, um, helped me put a um, new PayPal button on the site that allows people to pay with a credit card or debit card without having to enroll in, in PayPal. Anyway, so she said, um, episode 117 with Angela B. from Boise. Wow, great episode. Keep it up. It flowed so well. The bit about women having trouble with powerlessness was the most recent lead in topic to my traditional, but lightly so, women's home group meeting that meets weekly. It hit a huge chord, just so you know. I listened to 117 the very next day. You said in the podcast you wanted comments, so here is my high five on it. She gave me some, also, I think she gave me some pointers. Um, A lot of people have given me um, pointers from that episode that we recorded about, um, oh, a few weeks back when I, it was like, breaking the ice that I hadn't recorded an episode for a long time and I asked for help. Yeah, I got a lot of um, emails from that. And one person, Charles H. from Glasgow, Scotland, he has given, he has just given a loads of advice. In fact, and he's also written in a story mm-hmm. um, that we're going to be posting here real soon. And I'd like to have him on a podcast. He just seems really cool. But he um, cool. listened to, he found our um, website. And I think the first episode he listened to was 108, which is the one where you were speaking um, and going through the steps and so forth. Mm. And that was like one of the first times he's mm-hmm. ever heard someone talk about the steps secularly. And it was a huge thing for him. So anyway, he was kind of curious about whether or not there was a secular AA meeting near one. And yes, there is one in Scotland, I guess, that he was able to find. So pretty, Mm -hmm. pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, gosh. And the last one here is Megan F. And she, um, she also wrote in a story that we're that we're working on right now, and we'll be posting soon. And she just had some ideas. She said, um, Oh, I was asking about rebranding the podcast. And she says, as far as rebranding the podcast, I would be inclined to keep it as it is. The format is like an open meeting where everyone has a chance to share his or her take on recovery. With AA being in the name, it helps create that bridge from traditional AA to secular AA. It's also much easier to find the podcast and know it's about alcoholism. And she said, maybe it would help to clarify the purpose of the podcast and our website and to remind everyone what AA is and is not. In the simplest terms, any two or three alcoholics gathered together can call themselves an AA group. So yeah, and that was kind of interesting because, you know, every once in a while I get people, usually the YouTubers that find us on YouTube, complain because they say, you're not AA and all this kind of stuff. And they're right. I mean, this is a podcast. This is not an AA group or an AA meeting. This is a podcast. So, but it does have AA in the name and that kind of concerns me too, you know, because I, mm-hmm. I don't want to give the impression that, you know, this is what AA is or that I speak for Alcoholics Anonymous or anything like that, because I don't. This is just a podcast. I happen to be in AA. I try to stay as anonymous as I can. Um, mm-hmm. I try to approach it from a secular perspective. Mm-hmm. And that's what we talk about. I don't know. It's It's been, mm-hmm. I, I'm getting now to where my interests are, are outside of AA too. Uh, I'm interested in just recovery in general. Mm -hmm. And I get emails from people in other groups, like um, recently um, some gray sheeters from Columbia, Missouri reached out um, because they're interested in doing a secular Mm -hmm. gray sheeters meeting. So it's like, I would love to do podcasts like that, but some people want to keep you in an AA box. So that's why I was thinking about rebranding. So I could just, so we could talk about other fellowships Mm -hmm. as well, but I don't know. Well, I, I think because, you know, you have the beyond belief part that, I think it's it steps outside of the the AA line, um, and um, I don't know. I, I kind of agree with her. I think that uh, that you know keeping the the name as it is, I think yeah. reflects what what you're doing. Um, so you know you're coming from an AA background, and and AA is the the most well known you know part of of well, how I think of it, free um, recovery, most affordable, and <laughs> uh, doesn't ding your health insurance. So, so yeah, so I, I think that, um, that it is, it is 
quality name. I mean, there are lots of them out there, but I think that uh, what you have going right now is reflective of what you're doing. And and you have all sorts of things on the website where you, you know, say, hey, this, you know, I don't speak for AA. And, uh, you know, this is not a product of, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, we're not sponsored by them. We're not affiliated. And so, yeah, so I, I the people that you know, YouTubers and stuff, sometimes they don't know, or, you know, like in in some meetings that think that secular AA isn't AA as well, even though we actually are, (laughs) you know. I do love the YouTubers, by the way, even the ones that complain and and (laughs) it's it's, it's cool, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that, yeah, to see who who listens or um, who tunes in and, and, you know, again, even when they're annoyed about something, some of my biggest life changes came from people who said something that either hurt my feelings or made me angry or whatever, because, you know, for me, it made me, you know, question. Usually it was that I was trying to figure out how to prove them wrong, you know, and then I would find that maybe I I couldn't, or maybe they had a point and that would be a huge, you know, change for me to explore something else. Like with religion, you know, I was part of a group and was studying to become a United Methodist minister in, in college. And, and we were having, a, a United Methodist student meeting and somebody in the meeting had, had made a comment about uh, questioning something and and I had I had refrained you know something that I'd heard before that that makes no sense at all but at the time it seemed very you know profound um, and it was like uh, for those who believe no uh, no proof is necessary and for those who don't no proof is enough or something you know it really profound you know something that would be like a meme nowadays and the another person in the group was like what are you talking about you know that makes no sense you know and, and went off on on why you know that didn't make sense and I was horrified and upset and mad and and uh, but it was part of the change that got me to thinking and studying more and and ultimately led to to my disbelief and to you know becoming atheist and who I am today so yeah so yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I was pissed yeah. at the time though <laughs> 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 they didn't know what they were talking about how dare another Christian you know you know go after me so anyway it's kind of nice to do that but So now we're here to talk about step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Oh boy, I'll let you take this, the lead on this one, Angela. What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to go? (laughs) Um, Well, I'll I'll start with when I first, you know, started working on it. My sponsor uh, at the time talked to me about different powers that were greater than me. And uh, because, you know, I didn't like the the way it was phrased at all. And, uh, you know, and I I wasn't stupid. I knew they were implying God and, and stuff. But she took it the route of pointing at alcohol again as being something that was a power greater than myself because I couldn't control it. You know, I couldn't control my drinking. Um, And so that, uh, that, you know, calmed me down a little bit to be open to what that might mean. Um, As far as the, the restoring to sanity thing, I could see that, you know, the life I was living wasn't very sane. So I was, I was somewhat open to that. I mean, I got there, but after calling a suicide hotline. So, you know, so that seemed pretty reasonable as well (laughs) um, to to work on on step two. I looked at the the secular guide um, as to what they they say, and they um, phrase it as came to believe that a power uh, or that, yeah, uh, where did I write it down? Came to believe that spiritual resources. Yeah, can provide power for our restoration and healing. And um, and so I take out the spiritual um, part. Um, some some people are are you know good with it and and they're okay with the word. Or I do additional resources because you know yeah came to believe that additional resources can pro- provide power for our restoration and healing. And um and that that's what works for me for for this step. So, and I, I even consider it that, you know, alcohol was a we- resource that I used to, you know, air quotes, manage <laughs> my life, um, but that it wasn't effective. Um, and that that's, that was the same case for compulsive eating um, and, and such. And so what uh, I need to do on step two is, is to start con- 
considering, you know, what are additional resources um, that can help me heal um, and help me to um, get a balanced life or lead a balanced life. And so, and so part of what I do for step two is, um, is, you know, go through um, and read in the secular guide. And then um, I ask people to make a list of resources, you know, spiritual or otherwise, um, that they can either turn to for guidance, um, if they're feeling stressed or circling, you know, their thinking or whatever, or things that help calm or ground them. And I usually uh, start out with whatever the answer was to the first assignment. I, I generally ask them, you know, what's helped you uh, stay sober thus far, and then, you know, and then use that as their first, you know, recognizable resource that's that's helped them. So sometimes it's that they were going to meetings, or sometimes it's that they, you know, moved in with sober people, or you know, whatever that is, so that they could see that that resources are are you know all around um, that they can use. Um, and so um, so some of the the stuff that I list down are like attending a twelve step meeting, or you know, calling a sponsor or a trusted friend, or talking with a therapist. Um, let's see, uh, some other things like guided meditation or swimming. I, I really love to swim. It's, um, therapeutic for me, uh, spending time with animals, uh, reading, uh, writing inventory, helping someone else, uh, learning something new. Um, I, <laughs> I found a thing that, uh, that's helped me. Uh, I watched this guy do abstract painting with, you know, piano music on YouTube. They're like seven minutes long and it's just, he's painting abstract with this, you know, free, uh -huh. free, you know, um, music <laughs> playing in the background. And it's actually really soothing. You know, I don't always like what he's painted, but it's colors and, you know, yeah. So, um, but that is sometimes I just need something simple like that to calm my, my brain and my system. That down reminds me. There was this guy in the 70s who was on PBS and he, he, he had this big, huge um, afro and he used to um, paint and he used to talk about his painting and he's like a real calm right. voice. And I used to watch that guy when, when I was a kid. Um, and it was oh, like, yeah. something about that. Yeah. It was like, you know, he's like, he was just like, um, I don't know. He just, uh, I was just transfixed on the television when that guy was on for weird, some weird reason. Anyway, got to kind of remind me of that. <laughs> oh no, he's, 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 a, he's an icon. Bob Ross with the, the, the happy little trees and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he's, there's yeah, lots of memes and t-shirts and stuff because yeah, a lot of us remember him doing his happy little trees. And yeah, <laughs> even though I wasn't going to become a painter, you, you get mesmerized by it. But yeah, I found, I stumbled on this on YouTube and yeah, watch little, little things. So, so those are some of the stuff that, that, you know, help me or, or ground me and, you know, in uh, a spot for a little bit when I'm, I'm feeling like I can't handle something or, or distressed in some sort of way that um, particularly when you're early in the steps, um, you don't have a lot of tools yet. Otherwise, you wouldn't be at AA, right? <laughs> and so these are some things that, that, you know, early on can help you as you're, you know, going through the process of um, either, you know, drying out or, um, or or just starting to, to do, develop a program. Um, and there are things that I, you know, continue to do and, and um, extend and, and stuff to this day. Um, but early on, I think writing them down um, and getting a list so that, you know, when you're distressed and, you know, say you can't get a hold of a, a sponsor or uh, someone in AA, or, you know, you just don't want to text them with, you know, whatever your, your problem is, um, you can go to this, this list and see there's all of these different options of things I can do right now. So it's kind of like the, the next indicated thing slogan, except it's much more directed to, you know, calming, you know, your emotional state, um, as quickly as possible. And so, yeah, so those are how I, I consider a lot of the, um, the step two is, is to, to look at resources and to start thinking about like, uh, Wally in, in our group, um, he helped me understand that, um, that going to the mechanic is a, is, um, referring to a power greater than myself, you know, because I can't, I personally can't fix my car myself. I can, I mean, I have a Honda Civic and so it's like a 97 and I can fix the door stuff 
and I can, you know, when the window gets stuck, I can do those things, but there's uh, the majority of it I can't do. And so I go to somebody who has more knowledge than me in this area. And so technically they are power, it is a power greater than myself to find out what is wrong and to do what needs to be done. And, and that, you know, throughout my life, that's, you know, how I do things now where, Whereas when I was um, drinking or, or before recovery, um, something would go wrong with my car and I get very upset about it. And then, you know, I drink about it and that wouldn't solve anything. And it would remind me of all my other problems and that, you know, if I had my shit together, then I'd be able to fix my car or I'd have a better car or, you know, <laughs> and so just lots and lots of cycling. And so now when something goes wrong with my car, I, I know what the resources are outside of myself. To. That makes sense to me. That corresponds with my experience too. You know, when I when I look back about upon um, when I think I was really experiencing the step, it was just an outgrowth of of when I hit bottom and I, I felt like you know I, I had well I, didn't, I just had problems that were really beyond my control. Um, really, it was the first time in my life that I had, had reached this point where I knew I couldn't do it by myself anymore. I couldn't figure life out anymore. It wasn't working for me. And it was a frightening time. But at the same time, um, I, I reached out to AA. And when I did that, it was by phone. And that was a little tinge of hope that I had. But when I went to my first meeting, that's when I really believed that there was something that could help me. And it gave me hope. And that was the experience that I had. It was, an, it was a resource outside of myself that I could believe in that could help me. Um, and so... At the time when I looked at the step, um, for me, when I first saw the word insanity, it was it was a turnoff, and it was because I was stigmatized by mental illness because um, the way I grew up with a mother who was mentally ill, for whatever reason, I felt ashamed of that. Um, she ultimately died from suicide, and that was something that I was also, uh, you know, it was like I just it was a stigma that maybe that society had put on me, but also that I'd put on myself. So that word insanity really bothered me. But later I could look at it differently. But now I just kind of choose to just kind of leave that out. I just see it as, yeah, I have a problem. And I believe that there there are resources beyond myself that can help me. And that's actually what we that's actually what we do. I mean, when we start going to meetings, that's a resource outside of ourselves. Um, when we, you know, later on, I started going to therapy, a resource outside of myself. And I was doing things that I needed to do to get better. In, uh, in um, Jeffrey Munn's book, Staying Sober, um, without God, he looks at it as adopting a new, uh, as a, as adopting a healthy lifestyle, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, that's right. basically, I think, what I was doing without even really realizing it is I, the way that I was living, the lifestyle that I had yeah. wasn't working for me, and I came to believe that there was another way of living that that would be mm-hmm. healthy. You know. It was a shift in my thinking. Yeah, I, I was looking through the different um, versions of the twelve steps and the um, in step two to find one because you had said you know rewriting your own or you know ones that work for you and and I, I think that the proactive twelve steps kind of seem to be the closest. I see the big picture: the way to stop relapsing into self destructive behaviors is to build a healthier sense of self. And I like that you know because part of uh, part of it is you know I've, I've talked before is that alcoholism isn't my only thing. And that um, the healthier sense of self, I think is important. I, um, you know, we'll probably talk about this more as we get into the fourth step and in, in later on. Um, but sometimes in AA self is uh, kind of demonized as you know, you need to get out of self. And, and what I've learned in my recovery is that I actually needed to get into self and to develop a healthy sense of self and what that is. And speaking of resources, um, Serge Pringle, who wrote that he is a fantastic resource. He's actually a life coach. He's not an alcoholic at all. He's never had any experience with addiction, but he's a life coach and he, um, and a therapist and he just loves the 12 steps, but he, he, he likes the process of them and he has just written them out in his own way. He has all these videos that he's done that he's put on uh, YouTube and his book is a free PDF download. We did a podcast with him, um, some time ago. Yeah. So the, all that stuff is out there, but he's a good resource. He's a, he's a really cool guy, you know, just for someone who's totally not an alcoholic, but he loves the 12 steps. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think we've all met people in our life that were like, wow, I wish you had a program. <laughs> you know, you may not be an alcoholic, but uh, yeah, you definitely need something. I was just looking at um, after our last podcast, um, a woman that I know who was who was at my first meeting, actually, and, and lived down the street from me. Um, she got a hold of me on on Facebook. And so she asked me um, if I didn't mind uh, sharing with her what my higher power was. And I get this question a lot. Um, So I I thought about it. And and for the purposes of AA, I usually frame it as that it's the program of recovery as a whole, um, which, you know, includes attending meetings, um, being part of the community or fellowship, depending on which term you use, but I like community better. (laughs) Um, Working in the steps and then being being of service, um, you know, that's, that's basically, you know, what I would say my higher power is. And so, you know, that reminded me of, of that conversation when you said that he, he talks about the, the program or the, the going through the, the steps and, and what that is. And, and, and this really does for step two, um, helped me out a lot, um, particularly early on was that, you know, thinking of, of this as I think I used it more for step three, but but that the program of AA as um, a higher power, because people came here and, and a lot of them, you know, were able to get get sober. Um, and that, you know, it has, you know, this this way of living and, you know, prescription of how to how to do some things. And so I could get behind that as a is something that I believed in, you know, so I, I didn't think that, you know, individuals in AA were going to to save me or, you know, do anything special or that some sort of AA God was going to grant me parking spaces or anything like that. But that, you know, this seemed to be a system that helped people change their life. And I and I, I'm a big fan of systems. So <laughs> yeah, nowadays, I, I think that, uh, that, you know, as well as that, you know, I'm learning a lot more about, like I said before, self. And, um, and so I, I feel like I have a stronger sense of self and what that is within me and that I'm, I'm more able now to, to work with, you know, triggers and feelings and different things that come up that, you know, would throw me either in the beginning of recovery or definitely, you know, before that. Um, and so now, you know, my higher power, if I need to frame it for somebody is more, more of the open heart itself. I, I really try not to, because as I, I think I've mentioned before, I think putting your, your, you know, higher power or, or spiritual system or whatever it is in a box is, is not very helpful for most people. Um, but I also understand that, you know, for people who are, are new to recovery and or are new to AA and can only go to AA meetings that are traditional, um, having a common language is really important. You're really good about reaching people where they are and, and communicating with them in their own language, where, wherever that might be at the time. You're really good at that. You know, I, th- I think a lot of people get hung up on the higher power thing. I certainly was as a new person. I was, um, oh man, I was really spinning my wheels because I was I, my looking back on it. I don't want to judge myself too harshly, but I do. Um, looking back on it, I was really forcing myself to try to believe in some goddamn thing, you know, and I was really wanting to conform and be like everybody else, even though I couldn't believe in this God. I was, just, I was, I was doing everything I could. It was a huge waste of time. And, and I think it's just my opinion and opinions don't really matter when it comes to this kind of stuff, but it's just too easy to get hung up on the whole, what is, what is empowering me to do this when, you know, you don't really have to think about it so much because, you know, you're going to naturally be empowered to make change in your life simply by being around people that are doing the same thing. That's what happened to me. I just happened to be around a bunch of people who happened to be in AA and talking about God all the time, but they were doing things that were making change in their lives. And that's what was really giving me the power to do that. But I'm kind of like you right now. I've I've gone through a lot of evolution of thought and I've gotten to the point where I just kind of, for, for me, I don't even use the language higher power. It, it, it's it's not language that I personally use, but, but you're right. You know, there's some, that's what people think of AA. They think of AA as all about relying on a higher power and they use that language. So yeah, well, and people who have got sober in AA, um, you know, when they're sponsoring, they still use that language. We have somebody that came to our group and, and with specifically um, an assignment from their sponsor to ask us about, you know, the higher power, like, because the sponsor didn't think that, that she could get sober without a higher power. And so everybody in the group shared, you know, kind of, 
uh, you know, what works for them or, you know, how they might think of that. And there are a lot of them that said that, you know, it was BS and that, you know, and so I, I love my group for that because we have the gamut of people who are, you know, like me that try to translate and try to give people vocabulary in a way to, to be part of and people that are like, you know, screw it, a, a stupid, I just come here because I like you people and I don't want to drink and, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and all of that stuff. So, so I love that because it definitely gives you a perspective. But like you, I, I actually just this last Sunday, I, I go to a traditional women's meeting on um, Sundays that my sponsor goes to. And a woman who I hadn't seen probably since, you know, my, my first or second year was there. And uh, she came up to me afterwards and um, she, she remembered um, that I was in a meeting and somebody and I brought up that, you know, I didn't do this, this, you know, higher power thing and that I was struggling with it. And somebody, you know, started going off on the, the door doorknob thing. And they were trying to be helpful, you know, and I, I, I know now, you know, that, that they were, that, that they were one of the more open-minded ones, obviously trying to talk about, you know, the, that you yeah. can use anything, even the doorknob that's, that's open-minded in AA. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that I guess I went off on it. I was just like, who the hell would use a doorknob? What, <laughs> what is wrong with you people? Why would you even suggest that to me? I was so insulted and enraged and, you know, and I forget about those things that, <laughs> I mean, I do remember not liking it, um, but I don't remember that that I was actually, you know, pretty aggressive when I when I got here about my anger and frustration with the program. Yeah, a, a little bit different, but uh, that did get me to another thing I wanted to talk about with uh, with how I do step two or how I I take people through it. And this is this is the controversial part because um, I think it was brought up in one of the online forums, and and people have strong opinions about this, but. But, but I, um, my sponsor, you know, had me do it. And so it, it was helpful, a uh, helpful exercise. And, um, and she goes to only, you know, traditional meetings. She doesn't have a, a traditional higher power concept, but those are the meetings that she goes to and feels comfortable. So she had me read chapter four, uh, we agnostics. Yeah. And so, um, and so I have people do that. And, um, and then the, the goal with that or uh, the assignment is, is to look through and and, and try to identify um, where they use alternative names or concepts for God or higher power. And um, and so one, it, it takes them a little bit away from the condescension <laughs> because they have something to do other than read it and, and just be offended. So there's stuff in there like uh, they use creative intelligence and spirit of the universe and realm of the spirit. Um, you know, Angela, what's interesting about that chapter? Um, so I so I've been an AA for a long time, and um, and after before I realized I was an atheist. So so I I went to um, that chapter, chapter four, and I, I was trying to understand the big book, you know, and so I rewrote that chapter, but I didn't rewrite it completely like something new. I, I took, I took, I, I was going through the book and I was trying to write it without all the God stuff. And basically what I got out of it is the chapter is essentially trying to explain why we need help outside of ourselves. And it was actually um, I'm trying to um, break through the denial of the alcoholic to say that, listen, you know, it's, it's okay to ask for help. You know, it talks about pride being a problem denial being a problem. So I was looking at that in, in my life as a practicing alcoholic, and I wouldn't ask for help. And I wouldn't ask for help for anything, you know. So I finally got to a point where I, I had to ask for help. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I had to actually get to a point in my life where I realized there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking for help. It's actually a human thing and it's essential. I don't know if most people even have that problem. I had that problem. And I think it was just because of the time and place that I was raised yeah. that yeah. I guess you you just tough it out. It was the t was how I was raised, you know, but hopefully most people today don't have that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, it could be your role in your family and stuff too. Um, and also, you know, <laughs> let's analyze you for a minute here, John. <laughs> you mentioned that, that your mom had had mental health 
things going on. And so, um, so there is probably part of you that couldn't or learned not to ask for things or for help because, you know, that people probably in your family were dealing with, with her and stuff. And so, um, and so that's where the primary thing was because, you know, that's kind of in my family, there was a lot of, of similar things going on. And, um, and it wasn't that, um, I learned not to ask for help. Um, uh-huh. I, I could do that. Uh, but I had to, to first realize or come to terms with that mm. I didn't know it. And that's, and I had a lot of shame that, um, that I've had to work with and continue to work with and that I should know things, you know, and, and when I'm talking with people that I sponsor, or other people yeah. and, you know, and they say something similar, you know, it's easy for me to empathize and be like, why, why should you have known that? You know, um, have you dealt with this before? You know, no, this has never come up. Well, then why, why, you know, do you think that you should know it? But I can relate because that's, yeah. that's how I grew up is that, that I had shame and that, you know, I didn't know yeah. how to handle something. So having to ask someone for help was admitting that I didn't yeah. know how to do it or that I couldn't do it. And there was shame in that for me, you know, apparently I, I, I was supposed to have been born with everything already programmed of, you know, how to do this life thing. And so, yeah, so I, I think that, you know, that's what I heard in, in what you were talking about was, um, you know, um, and there's, there's certain things that it's, it's pretty easy for me to ask for help for, but, but still a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff, it, uh, it, you know, there's something in me that pauses when I, when I need to do that, you know, and, and is, you know, and questions, you know, whether or not, I, I should ask for help, you know, is this an okay thing to ask for help? And it turns out that, yeah, most things are. Now, if I only ask for help all the time, because I was, uh, you know, I didn't want to do it, you know, when I was lazy, then that's a, that's a little bit different. And you have to work different steps. For that. <laughs> but in general, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to learn. And what I found, um, and what I tell people, you know, new in meetings, um, we do this thing, I, I don't know if every every meeting does it, where we pass around a phone list, and most of the meetings in our area do, does it. it. It's kind of funny, because they'll ask a person if it's their new, their first meeting, and would they like a phone list? And the person's like, I, I don't know, what is that? You know, because we forget in, in the meetings that we have language and culture that, you know, we, we understand. And so, so yeah, so, you know, I explained to them that they're passing around a phone list with, you know, numbers on it, so that you can call, you know, any of us if you um, are feeling like you're going to drink or or want to know more or go to another meeting or, or anything like that or, or text us. And, um, and then I, I also emphasize that, you know, don't feel like you're burdening us because that's usually how I feel um, or have felt when I needed to ask for help. Um, and I said, because you're helping us get, you know, outside of our, our ego and, and stuff, you know, the brain stuff that we're usually, we're probably sitting there doing something something thinking about, you know, swirling on a, on a problem and you calling and asking us for help helps, you know, one, get us out of that swirl, um, helps us be of service to whatever it is, you know, you need to talk about. And then it reinforces in us, you know, what we should be doing when we're in that situation as well, or a similar situation. Um, so asking for help is, is, you know, actually, you know, when you think about it, these first three steps are all in a way, a natural process of what happens after you hit bottom. I call it hitting bottom. You have that, you have whatever happens to you in your life where you start thinking that you might have a problem with addiction, with alcohol or whatever. And then, and then you ask for help and then you make a decision to pursue that help. That's the first three steps. And you know, that asking for help thing is, is where you get the hope. I mean, you, you know, for me, I say you, but I, I say, okay, so I got to that point where I'm totally desperate and this step two is where I had hope. There's got to be hope. I got. I got. I need help. I need. There, I, there's got to be hope. And for me, it was AA. That's where I went for for help. I expanded upon it from there, though. Right. Yeah. Definitely. I, I, I think there's very few people uh, in this day and age that it's their only thing. You know, at least the ones that are are continuing to grow. <laughs> So, I mean, I know some people that, that AA is, you know, just their life, but, um, but yeah, in the, the society and culture that we currently live in, um, there's a lot going on and, um, and a lot more is learned, you know, a lot more. This is the main thing that existed when it was developed, but, you know, now there are so many different things that, um, that, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a helpful framework and, um, and that's, you know, 
why I continue to do this and, and continue to be a part of this and try to do this this podcast and stuff is that, you know, I come from a very impoverished background and um, I didn't have the resources to go to, you know, a therapist at the time or a rehab or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And so I uh, I needed something that, that was free or very, very low cost. And so, you know, my continuing to do this um, and try to, you know, translate, you know, how I do the steps or understand them is is my way of continuing to help people, you know, at least get to an, an understanding of their own of, of how to start, you know, reframing their life or, or build a program that can help them. And then hopefully, you know, move on so that, you know, they can get additional help if that's needed. So. Well, cool. So our next podcast will will cover step three. And I think we did a pretty good job on step two. I mean, it's really kind of simple. You know, it's just a matter of um, uh, if you read Russell Brand's um, book, you know, he, he he's really simple about it. You know, like, wow, I have a serious problem. And do I believe I can get out of it? Or he's, he's, he uses more vulgar language. But, you know, it's, that's right. but anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, I look forward to step three. Step three is actually uh, used to be one of my favorites. It still kind of is an interesting step. I look forward to talking yeah. to you about that one. Yeah, Thank me you. too. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that concludes another episode of AA Beyond Belief. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support our site and podcast, there are a couple of ways you can help out. You can post a review on iTunes, hopefully a favorable one. You can help us out financially with either a recurring or one-time contribution. You can do this by setting up a small recurring contribution at our Patreon page, which you can find at patreon.com slash aabeyondbelief, or through PayPal at paypal.me slash aabeyondbelief. And you can always just visit our site, aabeyondbelief.org, and click on the donate button. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back again real soon with another episode of AA Beyond.